This is the eighth talk in a series, and um, it's a, it's a, it differs from the preceding seven. In the preceding seven, I laid out the most cognitive portions of, of my work, um, and um, in terms of its framework, uh, I began by uh, talking about the different um, ways that systems that schematic systems that language has for structuring conceptual content. And one of them was uh, configurational structure, uh, which is the deline delineations in space and time and other dimensions that the um, uh, closed class forms of, of language uh, use, it, it can, can structure. Um, well, today's talk will fit into that. It's, it's all about events of motion uh, in which is you know, space and time. Um, but for the first for the first time, for the first time I'm going to focus on what's um, the difference between what's universal and what's typological or language particular. Everything up to this point has been more or less universal. Uh, there have been fundamental structuring properties of language. Today I'm going to focus on um, uh, both what's universal, but in particular the ways in which languages differ from each other in how they represent things, and in particular how they represent, how they express events of motion. Um, so, uh, and, and so there will be a, a lot of um, stress on, on language differences and also what some languages do uniquely uh, in, a, in, a dis in a distinctive way. So, so the emphasis is on how the, the wonder of wonderment of how different languages could be from each other. So the, um, an event of motion, as I uh, characterize it, is the, the event of motion proper consists of four components. Uh, one is the figure, the thing that's moving or located. And for me, when I say an event of motion, and I write it with a capital M, I mean either motion or, lo or stationariness, either one. So the figure is the thing that's moving or located, um, often represented by a subject noun, let's say. The, the next component is the uh, state of motion. So it's either, it has two possibilities, either move, written in capital letters, or be located. Uh, capital B with subscript lock. Uh, and those, then there's the component of path, which is the, if it's motion, it's path, and if it's locative, it's the site that the figure, figure occupies with respect to the ground. And so the ground is the fourth component. It's uh, the reference object with respect to which the figure's path or site is, is located. And, um, uh, and then that's the core of the motion event proper, but most languages uh, habitually rep uh, express that core event of motion with, together with uh, what I call a co-event, which re relates to the, the main motion event, typically as its cause or as its manner, but there's actually a, a whole range, pre its precursor, its subsequence, and so forth. So that's the basic event of motion. And uh, that's what's universal. That formula there is what's universal about representing uh, an event of motion. Uh, everything else is going to be typological, and there's um, uh, and the typo the, the main the, this particular typology is based on what a language or a language family. Uh, characteristically shows uh, which of these components the, the, at the semantic level it shows in the in the in the verb. <clears throat> so the the basic methodology is to look across different languages and see what semantic components characteristically show up in one or another kind of morphosyntactic component. That's the methodology. And we find that they're different. Uh, different languages characteristically put different components in different um, morphosyntactic categories, like in the verb. Uh, they put different things in there. And um, so the, the methodology is to observe this, look for any patterns that, um, that arise, and then look for 
uh, any cross-linguistic differences and, and see what patterns can be observed about that. So that's, that's the technique. Um, so the, the, the rest is to go through three, I'll start with three of the main typological categories of languages around the world. And the, they differ, in this, in this particular typology, they differ by what shows up in the verb. The verb, or verb root, always has the, the fact of motion in it. It's always got the move or the be located in it. In addition, it typically has one other semantic component from this motion event. Um, in, in the first type, type, typological category I'll look at, which includes um, English, and in fact it includes most Indo-European languages except Romance. <clears throat> it includes Finno-Ugric. It includes Chinese, although you're, wel you're welcome to dispute this with me, but that's my, my current uh, thought about the matter. Uh, it includes several other uh, smaller languages. And w its characteristic pattern is that in the verb or verb root, it has typically the, um, the fact of motion together with the co-event. So that you have a series of, and the co-event can be, as I said, something which is either um, uh, its cause or its manner. So you typically have a set of verbs in these languages which indicate um, uh, something uh, moving in one or another manner or due to one or another cause. Many verbs like that. <clears throat> so uh, all English is a characteristic, is, is a perfect example of the, of the type. And I'll illustrate it with, with English. So first, <clears throat> let's, um, it, it, since it covers both uh, stationariness and motion, let me first give some stationary examples. Uh, and these would be like, be located things. So uh, <clears throat> I'll give a series of examples of the way you normally say them in their conflated form, wh where the two parts of the uh, sentence are analyzed, are, are expressed together, and then in their unconflated form. So something like the, the lamp lay on the table, let's say, should be properly analyzed in this more analytic way as the lamp was located on the table. So that's the motion event proper, in this case in its stationary form, with the, with the manner of the lamp was lying. And then you typically move the, uh, ma the manner verb, the, this co-event verb, which is in a relationship of manner, to, to where the move is, uh, to where the be located is. So be located while lying comes out as to lie in English. So the manner, the, the uh, lamp lay on the table, or it could have been stand while standing. So be located while standing is to stand. This is uh, not terribly convincing, but it looks better if you um, take the next example. The rope hung across the canyon from two hooks. Here, uh, if you try and tease apart the two uh, elements, the motion event proper, that is the stationary version of it, would be something like the, uh, the rope was located uh, uh, across the canyon, or you might want to say extended across the canyon, with the manner of it hung from two hooks. That's the manner, it hung from two hooks. And then again, you can take the hang part move it over and conflate it, and you wind up with a sentence like, uh, it was located while hanging, and you wind up with a, a surface verb, hung. So the rope hung across the canyon from two hooks. Um, it's the fact that you've got across the canyon and from two hooks, these two separate phrases, that make you think that you've got two separate semantic components that they are in construction with. And that, that is, in fact, my analysis. The across the canyon part um, is in construction with the underlying semantic component was located or extended across the canyon. Whereas the uh, from two hooks is in construction with the uh, hang part, the hanging part. Uh, OK, so let's go to, so that's the only stationary example I give. Let's go to some motion examples. And these will be non-agentive, no agent in sight. 
So you'll just have the figure in the ground and so forth. And let's first consider the case where the relation of the co-event is one of manner. So you have things like the rock slid down the hill, the rock rolled down the hill, the rock bounced down the hill, the rock slid down the hill. And the way I'm going to analyze it is the, the motion event proper is the rock moved down the hill. So the down the hill part, which is a uh, kind of motion uh, phrase, a uh, prepositional phrase, uh, goes with the semantic component of move in capital letters. That is sort of like a basic, in fact, universal uh, semantic con uh, concept. So the, the uh, rock moved on the hill with the manner of the rock was bouncing, or the rock was rolling, or the rock uh, was sliding. And then once again, in the English manner, you take the uh, manner verb from the co-event, move it over, I mean, I'm just expressing it that way, it doesn't mean it actually happens cognitively that way, or any process actually um, occurs like that, but it's just to think of it uh, uh, dr uh, diagrammatically. Um, it's as if the, uh, the co-event verb moves over, uh, conflates with the move, the move verb in capital letters, and you get a, a new verb, something like the, the uh, rock uh, rolled down the hill. The next example in the normal uh, <coughs> surface pattern is the gate, the gate swung shut on its rusty hinges. Well, um, I would suggest that this comes from something like the gate moved shut. And shut is, doesn't have to be a verb in English. It can also be what I'm calling a satellite, uh, which is not a preposition. It's a satellite it's a, or a verb particle, it's been called traditionally. Uh, and so it's as if it came from the gate moved shut, where shut means to a position across an, an aperture, across an opening. And then with the manner of, um, the gate swung on its rusty hinges, or the gate creaked on its rusty hinges. So that's the, that's the co-event. And again, you could take the verb from there, conflate it with move, and you get a, a surface sentence like, the gate swung shut on its rusty hinges, uh, or the gate creaked shut on its rusty hinges. And again, the on its rusty hinges is a phrase in the final sentence that semantically goes with just a portion of the surface verb, uh, creaked, which is, or swung, uh, which is it's, it's swung on its hinges. That's, that's the logical correlation. It's swung on its rusty hinges. Uh, whereas the shut part, uh, meaning which is a conflation itself of to across an, an opening, to across an opening, um, goes with the move component. So each portion of the sentence, in effect, uh, is in construction with or goes with a, a, a differentiable and isolable and a, a, something you can analyze out component of this conflated verb creaked or or uh, swung. So now, these have been non-agentive. Now we have agentive examples. So we can add in to, to the formula I gave you the, at the outset, which just had the basic motion verb. We can embed that within a, a much larger matrix thing, which includes an agent. So I agented it that, and then this basic motion verb. And uh, my uh, symbolization for that is I have a capital A as a subscript in front of the move. So cap, move, cap, all caps, M-O-V-E, with preceded by a capital A is I agentively moved. Somebody agentively moved it. And it's itself a conflation of to, a, to agented that something move. So... Uh, so I agentively moved it, the keg, into the storeroom, which means I agentively caused it that the keg move into the storeroom, with the, um, with the manner of the keg rolled. Still, we're still with manner, no cause yet. We're still with manner. So, um, and that comes out as I rolled the keg into the storeroom, or I bounced the keg into the storeroom, or I slid the keg into the storeroom. So th this is now with an agent, uh, a whole agentive complex added on top of the, uh, 
the, uh, the basic motion event. The figure is now, the figure, which is the keg, now shows up as direct object, and the agent shows up as subject, so it's kind of been demoted. I twisted the cork out of the, out of the bottle, or I popped the cork out of the bottle. Um, this is again, I moved the cork out of the bottle, <clears throat> um, agentively, with the manner of uh, the, the cork twisted, or I twisted the cork, which either one, or the cork popped. Uh, so this means, uh, and then you wind up with, I popped the cork out of the bottle, like that, or I twisted the cork out of the bottle. It gives you the manner in which you removed it from the, from the bottle. Um, now we switch to where the relation of the co-event is one of cause rather than one of manner. So far, it's, they've been all manner. So now let's switch to the case where it's one of cause. And let's go back to the case where there's no agent, so that the subject is going to be the figure. So now all of a sudden, we have sentence, sentences like, the napkin blew off the table. And this I derive from the napkin moved off the table, just plain move in this case, the basic move motion concept, with the cause of, now it's not the, with the manner of, but with the cause of, something blew on the napkin, like a gust of air. And then again, you sort of take, it's as if you took the blow part and conflated on the move part, and you get the napkin blew off the table. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the bone pulled loose from its socket. That's the bone moved loose from its socket. Loose is here another one of those uh, satellites, paths, path satellites uh, that English has many of. And um, so it moved to, to a state of being loose uh, from its socket, moved out of its socket, with the cause of something pulled on the bone, and the result is the bone pulled loose from its socket. And this is all taking place without any overtly mentioned agent. I mean, there may be no agent around. There isn't in the case of the wind example. Um, then we can now add an agent again, and we have the same keg, but before, whereas you said I, I rolled the keg in, you can now see I kicked the keg into the storeroom. This is where now I agentively moved the keg into the storeroom with the cause of, I kicked the keg. Um, and the difference in how you know which category it's to belong to is um, which object manifested the basic meaning of the verb. If the verb is rolling, like I rolled the keg into the storeroom, well, I didn't roll. I mean, I didn't roll over and over. The keg did. So that's what I'm going to call it manner, is I moved the keg into the storeroom with the manner of the keg rolled. But in I kicked the keg into the storeroom, um, now it's I whom doing the kicking. It's not the keg that's doing the kicking. So it's, here's the keg, like a barrel. I kick it, and it rolls into the storeroom. It could be, it's either onset kicking or extended kicking. Um, or similar, I pushed the keg into the storeroom. Okay? So those are, and uh, other examples of that are, what? I chopped the tree down to the ground uh, at, at its base. Um, well, okay, here's a tree, and here again we can see which sentence fragment goes with which um, component of the verb. I chopped the tree down at the base. I say comes from, I agentively moved the tree down to the ground. So that, those parts, all the, the down to the ground, goes with this move portion. With the cause of, I chopped on the tree at its base. And English here puts an on in there, I chopped on the tree. If you, if you do something extendedly, like I chop on the tree, it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't mean anything actually happened. You just um, uh, repeatedly swinging the, the ax into the tree. Uh, uh, same with I pushed on the on this table. It doesn't mean the table moved. So that's the that's the um, uh, co-event. And again, if you put the chop chop, chop part, I guess you leave the on out there. I mean, you let it drop and then move it over, and you get uh, I chopped the tree down to the ground 
at its base. Well, the, the chopping part goes with at its base. That's where you're chopping it. So again, each fragment of the sentence goes with a different component of the, uh, of the main verb. And that's part of my motivation for analyzing these verbs as having separate semant semantic components, uh, each within its own separate clause. Um, there's also self-agentive. Uh, I don't know if I skipped it at some point, but anyway, there's self-agentive, um, which is uh, I, um, things like I ran down the stairs. That would come from I went down the stairs with the manner of uh, I was running. I, I was running. Uh, so, uh, and this is from a verb to go, which is itself derivative, a capital G O. It's a derivative from I caused my body to move, agentively caused my body to move. All that collapses into this go verb in my analysis, and which in turn can serve as, the, as, a, as a base onto which a co-event can uh, conflate. So once again, you get, um, I ran down the stairs, I limped down the stairs, uh, whatever, I slid down the stairs. So those are the self-agentive types. That's the first pass through the, the English type. And in principle, this is uh, going to be what um, most of Indo-European does. Um, except for romance. It's, it, it, I can ask you if this is mostly what Chinese does, it's mostly what finno ugric does, and so forth. And it's one of the main patterns uh, for representing motion, uh, what happens in the verb in, 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 the, uh, in the world. Uh, and when I say characteristic, by the way, I say it's the, the what characteristically shows up in the, in the verb. I mean, it's, um, it's the uh, most colloquial pattern, it's the most preponderant pattern, it's the, it's the, it's the pattern which uh, shows up in the, um, across most different kinds of um, uh, semantic uh, categories. So that's what I mean by characteristic. Every language ha does exhibit alternative patterns, but this is the most characteristic one for English and maybe for Chinese. Um, now we switch to another pattern, which I suspect is, in fact, the most common one in the world. Um, and it's where uh, what shows up in the verb, together with the fact of motion, is the path. So this, these kinds of languages uh, have all sorts of surface verbs, which mean things like to go along one or another, go along one or another path. And the, the languages for which this is the characteristic type include uh, romance languages, uh, meaning those that evolved from, uh, developed from Latin. Latin itself was uh, a, uh, an English type pattern, but it underwent a, uh, a typological shift and gave rise to romance, include, such as Spanish. Um, it's characteristic of Semitic languages, Polynesian languages, Japanese, Korean, and a number of American Indian languages, such as Nez Perce and uh, Caddo. And, uh, uh, and Spanish is a perfect example of the type. And uh, in this language, so it's, we expect Spanish to say things that, in, the, in other words, to a speaker of English, uh, or perhaps Chinese, what could be more natural than saying a sentence like, the bottle floated into the cave? How else could you say it? The, here's a cave, here's water, here's a bottle, the bottle floated into the, into, bottle floated into the cave. How else could you possibly say it? Well, it turns out that in uh, a Spanish-type language, uh, which includes then Japanese and Korean, um, you can't say it that way. It's impossible. There's no way in the language to say it that way. Instead, you have to say something like, the bottle entered the cave floating, um, and which is, in fact, how Spanish says it. You, you say, la botella, my Spanish accent is not great, la botella entró a la cueva flotando, the bottle entered to the cave floating. Or you can put the flotando after entró, you can say, la botella entró flotando a la cueva. Um, 
So uh, if you tried to say something like the bottle floated into the cave, well, first of all, Spanish has no word like into. If you tried saying something like la botella flotó en la cueva, it would only mean that here's the cave, the bottle's already inside, and it's just floating there. That's all. So there's no way to say it like English. Um, and so all the uh, kinds of uh, path directions uh, that, we, that English would express with a satellite, and I'll, I'll get to that later, like the bottle floated into the cave, out of the cave, past the island, uh, through the tube, all that kind of stuff. Spanish is instead going to express with separate verbs. They, I call them path verbs. And Japanese also has them. Um, it turns out Chinese also has them, um, but, and you can use them as path verbs, as the, as the main verb of the sentence, but uh, apparently most characteristically these days, that's, that was true for classical Chinese, these days you typically use your path verbs as a second verb, a second verbal element, uh, which I'm also going to call a satellite. And so you would say things like, instead, um, the bottle floated in, or bottle float enter, where the enter is coming more and more to resemble a path satellite like English in. I mean, this is me talking. You can disagree with me. Um, so, uh, uh, so Spanish has not only the bottle entered the cave floating, but also the bottle exited the cave floating. It means moved out. Salió de la cueva. And the bottle uh, uh, passed the, uh, the rock, pasó por la piedra, uh, and the bottle, there's no English word for it, um, traversed, I guess, the tube. Again, it's pa pasar in Spanish. Pasó por el tubo uh, means moved through. Or the, ba the, the balloon moved up, ascended through the chimney, you'd have to say, and the globo uh, subió por, por la chimenea flotando, or the bottle descend, uh, the, um, the, the balloon floated down the chimney, it's pasó uh, bajo uh, flotando por la chimenea. Um, the bottle floated around the island, in Spanish it's an uh, idiom, le dio vuelta, uh, gave turn to the island, but still the, the path is expressed in the verb. Um, the bottle crossed the canal, here's a canal, floated, floated, English would say floated across the canal, the Spanish says the bottle crossed the canal floating, uh, cruzó el canal flotando. Um, the bottle floated away from the uh, bank, is se fue de la, se fu, se fue de la orilla, the bottle floated back to the bank, returned. You'd have to say the bottle returned <clears throat> to the bank. Volvió a la orilla. Uh, the two bottles um, floated apart. Se separaron flotando. The two bottles floated together. Se juntaron flotando. They separated, they joined floating. <clears throat> you even have it for notions of along and, and all about. So the, the bottle floated along the canal. It's iba flotando, there's a verb for it, to move along. And the bottle floated all about the canal. It's andaba en el canal flotando, or por el canal flotando. <clears throat> um, you have, uh, and then you have uh, all the same kinds of things <clears throat> with an agent. All this has been without an agent, so you have agentive counterparts of this. <clears throat> Usually it's separate verbs, you know, where, whereas English type languages keep the path indicator in the satellite the same, whether it's with an agent or without an agent. So um, the, the barrel rolled in, I kicked the barrel in, it's still in, in. But Spanish, since it's putting its path in its verbs, it often has a distinctive, and so does Japanese, have distinctive causative counterparts for the same path. So instead of entrar, which is non-agentive, a figure moves in, like the ball, the bottle, the bottle entered the cave. 
then all of a sudden, if it's agentive, now you have to switch to another verb, meter. So, like, uh, I, I inserted the keg into the uh, pantry with a kick, is meti, et barril, uh, en la bodega, uh, de un, what is it, pedazo, I guess, uh, with a kick. So that's how they wind up saying that. Uh, I, oh, I should say that the, given that the verb is now occupied by the path and cannot express the, the manner or the cause as, it did, as, as the English verb did, now manner or cause has to be expressed elsewhere in the sentence. So, and you often do that with some kind of gerundive type of expression like flotando, floating, or with uh, a, a prepositional phrase like de un pedazo with a, uh, with a kick. <clears throat> So, um, let's see, that's, so that's cause to enter. There's also uh, uh, cause to exit, with, to extrude the barrel from the, or what do I have, the barrel from the storeroom or whatever. Uh, anyway, it's sakar. Um, <clears throat> and you would have uh, other examples. Oh, yeah, I, um, with an agent, I uh, felled the tree with an axe, where English would say, I chopped the, the tree down. Spanish says, I caused to fall. I felled the tree uh, by chopping on it, or with chop, with, with an axe, or with chop blows. So again, you have to say, tumbe el albo. Uh, that's what the main verb is. And then you have to express the cause elsewhere, like cortándolo, uh, uh, no, achándolo. Uh, chopping it, or con una hacha with a with a uh, with an axe, or de hachazos with axe blows, and the same with another example would be I um, in English you'd say I cut the wrapper off the package. In Spanish you have to say I removed the uh, wrapper from the package. So quité, no, Is it, yeah, quité. Uh, El papel del paquete, I removed, uh, the, specifically, remove in English is ambiguous whether it's off a surface or out of an enclosure. Quitar is specific to off a surface, so that's, um, and uh, I, I removed it by cutting it, or cutting it. And the, uh, there's a whole series of put verbs which are systematized, uh, also agentive put verbs, whereas English would have put or take, depending on the direction. So um, I put the something, the, the figure, into the ground. Spanish would say meter, the figure, a the ground. Uh, put the figure on the table. It would be uh, poner, the figure, in the table. Then I took the figure out of the ground. It would be sacar. And I took the figure off the table. It would be quitar. And put two figures together is um, juntar, take two figures apart, separar. So it's, it's an immensely consistent system. The English system is consistent, the Spanish system is consistent. Um, now you might be asking at this point, how come I'm able to translate a lot of these Spanish path verbs with English verbs, like exit and enter and so forth? Well, if you look at them, it turns out that almost all of these path verbs that I'm using in English to translate the Romance path verbs are, in fact, borrowed, <clears throat> borrowed from Romance languages. Uh, they're not native Germanic words. They're not native English words. They include all these path verbs that I've been using to translate the Spanish ones in English are verbs like to enter, from Spanish to or French, to exit, to ascend, to descend, to pass, to cross, all from Romance languages, um, to separate, to join, uh, what else is there, to advance, to uh, return, instead of go back, to return, they're all borrowed from Romance where it's the native type. English <clears throat> does have a few path verbs, but they're rather few. There are things like uh, rise, leave, follow, um, 
but um, otherwise it's, it's rather, it's not the native type. And in fact, German uh, doesn't even have these, all these romance ones like enter, exit, Ro German even lacks those. And uh, we'd have a harder time translating it if I were giving this talk in German, which I couldn't. Uh, it would um, uh, have an even harder time trying to render the Spanish uh, verbs. So type three is the, the, an, another main type, well, it's, but it's, it's actually quite rare. Uh, it's uh, the type in which uh, what is characteristically conflated with, in the verb, in the main verb root, with the fact of motion is the thing that's moving, the figure. So we have a whole series of verb roots, which means for one or another kind of object to move or be located. And it's, it shows up in the American Indian language that I worked on, Atsugewi, which is an, a Hokan language spoken in Northern California, or that was spoken in Northern California. It's now pretty much dead. Um, it's, uh, it's the Navajo, main Navajo characteristic pattern. And it's, it's also in, uh, it shows up as one of the characteristic patterns in, um, in, some, in some Mayan languages. And uh, to give an example of how it works, um, <clears throat> in Atsugewi, uh, Atsugewi is a polysynthetic language, which means that it, it has a, a verb root at the center and many prefixes and suffixes. So you can hardly um, get away without saying, uh, to, to say just anything, no matter how simple. You, you've got to put in a lot of prefixes and suffixes. And typically one of these polysynthetic words stands for a whole sentence. You often don't need much more in the sentence. Um, uh, and you, well, so that's the nature of a polysynthetic. You can go for, uh, you can go for a long time in, in, in speaking one of these languages without ever using a noun, uh, just a bunch of um, polysynthetic verbs. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so the verb root, uh, expresses one or another, typically, characteristically expresses one or another kind of figure, object, moving or located. English, as, as usual, has some examples of the type. Uh, and two examples, one non-agentive, one agentive. So the verb to rain, for it to rain, uh, is an example of the type. So you can say in English, it rained in through the bedroom window. Well, that means that raindrops came in through the, moved in through the bedroom window. But instead of having a noun subject uh, representing the figure, it's conflated in the verb. So to rain means for rain to move. And similarly, for an agentive type, uh, to spit is an example. It means for, to cause it agentively that a packet of spit move. Uh, in the given direction. So you could say, I spat into the cuspidor. A cuspidor is a receptacle for spit. Um, so uh, that's, those are examples of English with verbs that incorporate the figure along with the fact of motion. Well, this is what Atsugewi does as its characteristic type. It has um, uh, scores or dozens of verbs that, verb roots, that refer to some kind of object or material as, be, as moving or as located. So, for example, um, uh, what's the, oh, a uh, loop, uh, which can't, typically these can't occur by themselves, they have to be prefixed and suffixed, but L-U-P, loop, typically refers to uh, a small spherical object uh, moving or located. It, it could refer to hailstones, it could refer to a, round, a large round candy, it could refer to an eyeball. So if you're going to poke someone's eye out, that's the verb you'll use. That's the verb root, to cause an eyeball to move out of its socket. That's the verb root. Um, there's a verb root, just a glottalized T, for uh, a planar object to move or be located. Could be a uh, a sun sh sunscreen, sun shield on a baby's cradle cradle board, could be a patch on a clothing, 
could be a shingle on a roof. Um, and so there's a number of these. And uh, well, the one that I'll illustrate, well, there's, there's another one. Uh, well, the one that I'll illustrate right now is stuck. Stuck means for runny, icky material to move or be located. It could be guts, intestines. It could be uh, rotten tomatoes, chewed chewing gum, uh, runny mud, stuff like that. So, uh, so here's a typical kind of uh, Atsugewi word. Um, you would put stuck in the middle, and here's going to be a locative example. Um, the, it, there's a suffix which means uh, it has to be suffixed, and it, it, giving you some kind of path plus ground together. In this case, it means on the ground. So the ikka means on the ground. And it has to take an, a, a cause prefix, um, which indicates the, the cause that gave rise to the event of the main, of the main uh, verb root, which in this case is uh, for icky material to be located. And the cause in this case is as a, is a prefix o, oh, which means um, uh, as a result of an object's own weight, acting on it. I mean, you could, modern times you could translate it as, a, as the result of gravity acting on it. So you'd get a verb, with, if you add on all sorts of prefixes and suffixes, which you need for person and tense and uh, mood and, vo and voice and, uh, and, and evidentials, uh, you wind up with something like uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, means literally uh, runny icky material is located on the ground as the result of its own weight acting on it but it could refer to for example it means that generally but it could be used if you see some guts lying on the ground and you can say um, or let's take now a motion example uh, if you take the same verb root and you suffix it with um, uh, a directional suffix, meaning into liquid, it's that, uh, and you put on an, a, a cause prefix, which means as the result of wind blowing on it, which is ja, and you put on all these prefixes and suffixes that you need for inflections, you would get tsvastakitsta, And literally it means Icky material moved into liquid as the result of the wind blowing on it. So, for example, to instantiate it, it that's, the, that's literally what it means, but a, a typical application of it would be if there's a, a creek and there's some guts lying there and a gust of wind comes up and blows the guts into the creek, you say, ah, it's what's the it's the. So that's the, um, uh, how, in one single word, how you refer to that. Or, to put on not an agentive example, uh, there's a directional suffix which means into fire, jis, and uh, there's a directional, there's a cause prefix which means by acting on it with a, a linear object moving axially, which is ju, and if I did it, you could say, <coughs> um, which then means I caused it that, Icky material moved into a fire by acting, by acting on it with uh, a linear object that I'm moving axially. And that could mean something like, I had a stick and I prod, I poked the, the, the guts or mud or whatever, rotten tomatoes, into the fire. So all that's in one word. Okay, so that's how Atsugewi does it. And it too is thoroughgoing in its type. So um, it doesn't just treat uh, uh, ordinary objects that way. It also treats body parts that way and garments that way. So for example, uh, English treats body parts uh, just like it treats any other object. So, uh, in its, so that it makes it the figure. Um, in this case, if it's agentive, uh, like... Uh, Putting, so you can say, I held my hand over the fire, and the verb is therefore going to be one of uh, 
manner, uh, 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 manner or cause. So I held my hand over the fire. I pulled my arm out of the out of the cage. I uh, put my I laid my head on the pillow. I or laid my head on the pillow. I uh, put my ear up against the wall. All these kinds of it's just like normal any normal English sentence. An atsugewi, it does it like any normal atsugewi sentence. It makes the verb root the place in which you show the object that's moving. So there's um, a separate verb root, which means for the ear to move or be, or move or be, move or be located. It's ismak. And if you put your ear up against um, a, uh, a wall to listen to somebody in, in the other room, you'd say, wismak iksa. Wismak iksa. Or find it, wismak iksa. So it means uh, ismak is to cause, to, to ear move, uh, to move one's ear all in one root, and uh, followed by the directional suffix, which means laterally against a vertical surface. Uh, <clears throat> so, so it's totally consistent. The same goes with garments. So, oh, English does, by the way, have a few of these kinds of verbs, uh, as English keeps <sighs> offering examples of how other languages do it. So for example, to step means to move the foot. So I stepped up onto the curb, it means I moved my foot up onto the curb. I leaned out the window, means moved my torso. I reached toward the ceiling, means your arm. So English has a few, but that's the only atsugewi way. Um, same with garments. Uh, English has a few. Normally you say, I put on a shirt, put um, uh, the, the hat on her, that kind of thing. Uh, but we do have a few that are in the verb themselves, like I, um, I booted up, I shod the horse, put the shoes on the horse. Um, but this is the only Atsugewi way. They have verb roots which refer to the particular uh, garment that you're moving. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the third main type. Next, so, so these are the, the main characteristic ways of uh, 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 moving the, the various parts around, uh, the various components of the, uh, of the uni otherwise universal uh, motion event. These are the three main patterns. But you can uh, ask, what about all the other possible patterns? So let's go systematically through them and see, well, what has the world's languages done? What have the world's languages done with them? One possibility is, well, what about the ground object? Why not put the ground object in the verb uh, together with move and have a whole series of verbs which mean to move with respect to one or another kind of ground? And this barely exists at all. Um, I had to scrounge to find a few in, in English examples. Um, the, the, the morpheme plane in the verb, in the, full, full, the, in the two morpheme verb to emplane or to deplane, well maybe you can uh, mount an argument that would say that plane as a morpheme means to move with respect to a plane, an airplane and that the path is now being expressed separately by separate morpheme, the prefix M or D. Um, but this barely exists as a system at all. If, if any language were to have it as its uh, characteristic system, you'd also have to have forms like to circumplane, mean I walked around the airplane, to transplane, I walked through the airplane. Uh, and then you'd have to have things like uh, to enhouse, meaning to walk into a house, to dehouse, to walk out of a house, to circumhouse, to walk around a house, and it doesn't exist. No language that I've ever heard of has anything like it. So the question, it's for me a mystery. I do not know why uh, uh, this possibility is left as an orphan. Um, maybe uh, some language somewhere does have it, and, but it's just so down the, far down the hierarchy. There's a kind of hierarchy, the um, uh, the pattern that conflates the figure, like Spanish and Japanese, seems to be the most common in the world, is just impressionistically. 
the pattern that conflates the co-event seems the next most common. Uh, the pattern that conflates the figure is pretty, uh, pretty uh, minor. It shows up in just a few languages, but it does show up in a few. Maybe there's some language somewhere that's never been recorded that puts the, does this with the ground, but um, it hasn't been. I, I see no um, discourse reason why it shouldn't be just as viable. Uh, but okay, it, and you can present our reasons why you would think so. The next possible, so it's a mystery. The next possible thing is for two uh, of the universal components to show up conflated together with the fact of motion in the verb. And that does show up as various languages minor systems, but never as the major system. So for example, English does have a minor system of move, plus a certain path, plus a certain ground. So for example, is they're usually agentive. Well, here's, an una, here's a non-agentive one, to birth. Like the, um, the, the ship birthed in its uh, assigned, uh, well, it's assigned birth. <laughs> it's assigned uh, uh, mooring or something. Uh, it means to move into a birth. Usually they're agentive, so, um, You'd have things like um, to shelve. So to sh I shelved the books means I caused that books moved onto the shelves. And to box, I, I boxed the apples. I caused it that apples moved, and here it is, move into boxes. So move into boxes is to box. Cause to move into boxes is to box. Um, there's another pattern of the sort uh, where you have figure and move and path, but not the ground. So to dust something, she, or to powder, she powdered her nose, means she caused it that powder move onto her nose, and then you mention nose separately. Uh, so cause powder to move onto, and uh, to what, uh, tag a suitcase to or to, to, let's say, to scale a fish, to cause the scales to move off of a fish. So those patterns do exist, but no language I know of has any major system of that, possibly because it, it would be too costly. You'd have to have a separate lexical item for every possible combination of, um, of you know, or relevant combination of, of, let's say, ground and path. For everyone, you need a new uh, lexical item, and languages are much more sparing of their lexicons than that. So, but uh, still, I think it would have been a possibility if you'd picked as ground objects not things like um, uh, boxes and shelves, but things like uh, volumes and uh, planes and. Uh, things that are geometrically more generic, it could have been a viable system. But again, we, we, we don't find it. Fourth possibility is that nothing conflates. Uh, you just have a verb to move, which you keep using over and over again. Move, 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 move. Or be loca, be loca. And again, you don't find any language with that. Possibly the reason is that it's um, inefficient. Um, you might as well use up that space, that slot, with, uh, since it's just going to be repeated over and over again, with something that's more contentful in character. So maybe that's the reason. Now, as it happens, you do have languages, languages with this kind of system for part of their, uh, their uh, motion events. Spanish, for example, does have uh, a single fixed verb for the be located concepts, like estar, they, keep, they say over and over, estar, estar, estar. And, um, and uh, they do not continue their normal pattern of conflating the, 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 the motion component with path. Other languages do, like Halkamalam is a Canadian Indian language, 
and it's um, it's a Hapton, I think, and it's um, it's otherwise like Spanish in its conflation pattern, but but it is more consistent. It does have locative verbs that mean things like to be in, as one verb to be in, another verb to be on, another verb to be between, and so forth. Um, so uh, okay, so that's uh, that type. Then there is a fifth type where. It's something like, it's as close as languages tend to get to this last type, where they make, they don't have just a single verb move, but they have, they make, mark a few distinctions, but not many. So one of the American Indian languages around Clear Lake in California, one of the Pomo languages, for example, uh, Southwest Pomo, I guess, um, makes a, a three-way distinction of its move verbs sort of Atsugewi-like, it, it distinguishes three kinds of figures, but just three. It, it's, if the figure is single, dual, or trial, trial or plural. Um, and, uh, but it has nothing like Atsugewi has, where it, 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 distingu- it has whole different verb roots for different kinds of objects as figures moving. Just these three. So it's pretty, and you, so you hear those three verbs, those three verb roots, over and over and over and over again. <clears throat> so, it, so you know, one one might object; it's too monotonous. But nevertheless, um, okay. So that kind of thing does exist. Um, fi- n- next, we get split, and then we do get split systems. So a split system is a, a language which, in fact, has. A, uh, several different ones of these basic uh, types, and Spanish is one of them. So as we already noticed, for locative things, it has one, has one type of conflation pattern, namely zero conflation. Nothing moves in to the be located verb. For motion, it has two types. Uh, if it's the one we mainly saw, which is where the path conflates. But it does this primarily where for only certain path notions where you're crossing a boundary like into. But as uh, Jon Askey and Dan Sloban have pointed out, um, if it's uh, a kind of path which uh, doesn't um, cross a boundary, then in fact you have, of all things, the English conflation pattern. So in fact, in Spanish, you would actually say uh, he ran from the from his house to the uh, to the school. You, word for word, you'd say you know run from the house to the school, or at least run to the school. So because there is no path verb in Spanish, which is to to transmove uh, between uh, to to transmove. Home and school, running. There's no way to say that. I'm just making this up to transmove. So there's no such verb. Uh, okay, so, and then finally, I might as well skip this one. There's a mixed type. Greek has a mixed type, uh, but we can maybe skip, skip that in the interest of time. Okay, so um, I've sort of, let's see. So now we're in a position to look at the, uh, the, the type, the verb, what, what shows up in the verb has been um, the most diagnostic of the surface forms, the, the morphosyntactic forms, to look at to, to see how languages differ from each other typologically as to how they express emo- motion events. It's been, the, it's been the best. But once a language puts one of the semantic components, one of the motion components, into the verb, what does it do with the rest of its components? Where do they go? Well, for this, there's a second place to look to see what happens. That's the second most diagnostic, and that's the satellite. And the satellite is um, a, my own term for a kind of uh, grammatical category. It's, uh, it's, it's the element which is in direct, directly in construction with the verb root. But, and um, 
again, we can look at the satellite as a kind of uh, uh, receptor uh, constituent, just like we looked at the verb to see, okay, we, look at, we can look at the verb, see what shows up in it uh, semantically in terms of the semantic components. In English, what shows up in it is the co-event. In Spanish, it's the, uh, the path, and in Atsugewi, it's the figure. So then what shows up in the satellite? Well, again, we have uh, a range of possibilities of what's left in the, uh, of the remaining uh, semantic components in the motion event. So um, let's look at English. In, of the, of the um, semantic, uh, of the motion event semantically, the co-event is already accounted for showing up in the, uh, in the verb. Okay, well, what shows up in the, in the satellite? Well, it's the, it's the path. In fact, in, in, more specifically, in English, it's the combination of the, of the satellite, which goes with the verb, and the preposition, which goes with the, with the following noun, uh, uh, typically the ground noun, that together, in English, represent the, the path. So, for example, if you geometrically have uh, an object that moves, uh, where something here's an object that is previously it undergoes a path where first it's inside the, the the enclosure and then it's outside. That path in English is expressed by, um, and I give the little formula there. It's uh, out as uh, a satellite to the verb, together with of as a preposition with the following noun. That combination represents that particular geometric conceptual path. So, and, and there's rules in English where um, you can't drop the out, you have to keep it, um, but if the, if the following ground object the, um, that the of goes with, if it is uh, a deictic or an anaphor, something that you already know about, you can drop it and remove the preposition along with it. So you can say, um, I stood just inside the door of the house and then I ran out of it. Or you could say, or you, given that context, you can say, or uh, I stood in the, just inside the door and then I ran out, dropping the of it. But the out plus the of is together the satellite plus the preposition combination that represents this particular um, uh, path concept. Well, so English has lots of, lots of these path satellites. They're really satellite plus preposition combinations. Um, and I'd list a whole bunch of them. They're uh, all the ones that you're probably familiar with. Uh, so I ran into the house. It's run into, run out of the house. Um, uh, then there's ran up the stairs, ran down the stairs, uh, uh, d just the whole list there of standard satellites which, con which convey this, um, and there's several dozen of these, I suppose. Uh, in addition, I list second uh, some ones which are less, would be less likely to be included as path satellites, but I, which I think should be, would they function perfectly the same. This is where it starts off with loose, like the, um, what's that? What? Are you guys, by the way, or, yeah. you have the, the place, I hope. The, bo the bone pulled loose from its socket. So loose from is the thing that represents this particular, and f uh, free of, the, the coin melted free of, or free from the ice, either one. Or clear of, it represents a specific spatial uh, configuration. Uh, she swam clear of the oncoming ship, or just she swam clear. So here's a ship, oncoming ship. Here she is in the, in the way. She swam this way. She swam clear of the oncoming ship. That's uh, a, a particular spatial configuration. So there's a whole set of these. Uh, uh, froze, stuck to the window, baked fast to the enamel, to the to the clay and so forth. Um, okay, so these are these are all the the way that English, uh, where uh, it's uh, takes the 
path component has to be expressed somewhere and places it in the, uh, in the satellite plus preposition. Now, next, what Atsugewi does is it has a whole series of uh, uh, suffixes directly following the, the figure verb, which uh, together combine together uh, path plus ground. So there's a whole, it doesn't separate, separate, separate those. It has, it combines path plus ground. So there's a whole series of them that represent uh, some dozen or so that together represent English into plus some kind of ground. I think I'll diagram it. If I, if I talk like this, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, these are all separate geometric configurations that Atsugewi uh, is very uh, strict on dis distinguishing, discriminating. So you have into liquid is one subject, it's it's the, if you have into a, um, a uh, into an aggregate, such as into a crowd of people, into bushes, uh, into a deer's stomach, uh, I mean, into a deer's rib cage, it's considered an aggregate, aggregate. you use another one that's ispuma, uh, if you have into a um, uh, <laughs> if you have uh, into a um, uh, aerial enclosure like into a corral that's another one into a volumetric enclosure uh, that's or, or or this way either one that's a, that's yet another one that's ips uh, and that could cover for example into a room. Uh, into a, a deer's stomach, into an oven. Uh, then there's another one which is into a gravitic container, such as uh, acorns uh, into a basket, uh, things in your cupped hand, water in a lake basin, all of these would be gravitic container-like. Um, there's into a fire, there's into a uh, solid substance, three of them in fact. One is for uh, down into the ground, literally the ground. That's mit. Uh, there's another one which is laterally uh, into the solid substance, like if this is a tree trunk and you uh, swing an axe into it, that's uh, iksa. So the verb root is snut. And if I did it by swinging, it's snut. And then if I did it into a tree trunk, it's sosnitiksa. And then um, the last one of this is down into the substance of something raised above the ground, like a tree stump. That would be um, uh, jisu. So it would be sosnitsu. Uh, no, so, um, Furthermore, there is into... Uh, into a corner, which is another geometric uh, distinction. Uh, and what else? Oh, yeah. Uh, over a rim and into, and into, and that includes, for example, w water pouring down into a gopher hole or a fly going, flying into your mouth because your mouth is perceived as a, an uh, opening with a, a rim surrounding it. There's another one which is down into the, a pit in the ground, such as a house collapsing into a cellar, or if you dig a, a deep pit to trap a deer, then if the deer falls in, it goes with that one. That's tabuma. And uh, other distinctions. Uh, there's also, uh, well, into someone's face. Uh, throw water in someone's face, that's mikka. Uh, so, these are uh, fine distinctions <clears throat> these are fine distinctions that uh, Atsugiwi makes with, uh, just, just with the um, into notion, whereas English would just cover all of these uh, 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 grossly with just the more generic term in and the uh, there is no in in Atsugewi. It's much more finely divided, and they never make a mistake that I detected. Um, 
th these are just as clear to them as, as uh, for distinctions as anything else. So anyway, but in any case, the point here is that they resent, re represent both path plus ground together. Let me check the time. Okay. Hmm. If you close this on your thumb, it uh, cuts it. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, another, uh, well, let, let me, uh, maybe I should uh, start skipping things. Yes, I will. Uh, let me just go to one other kind of satellite type. In fact, I will uh, go to the um, uh, Atsugewi type that expresses, uh, uh, well, there, there are languages that have satellites that express um, the, the figure. Uh, uh, so you may have heard of, I don't know if, you, if you're into linguistics, you may have heard of uh, uh, noun incorporating languages, and CADA would be an example. So you, um, instead of saying um, uh, the cattle went into the water or, or entered the water, you would say the cattle water entered. So it's, it's, a, it's a, again, a compound verb. The main verb root is enter, but it takes a prefix, which refers to water, and which tells you the ground. So the cattle water entered. In fact, they even have it with is, so something can, instead of saying the house is at the wood's edge, you actually say it house is, is. it house bees at the wood's edge. So um, it's house being at the wood edge. So uh, it's rather consistent itself in that respect. Um, other languages, uh, uh, Nez Perce uh, expresses the manner, again with a, a, a prefix. So it has a verb root, just like Spanish type verb roots, to ascend, to descend, to cross, and it has prefixes, which prefixes which mean things like flying, crawling, sailing, and so forth. In fact, you can almost um, picture Spanish or Japanese developing into a Nez Perce type of language. As it stands, Japanese has the uh, main. Uh, path verb as the second of two verbs, like um, to crawling uh, enter, uh, which I, th how do you say that? Uh, well, I'm not good at Japanese, but, but anyway, you say crawl enter. And enter is the um, how, and what's enter uh, in Japanese? Hairu. So you could say how hairu. Yeah, hairu is to enter, and you can, how is uh, uh, is crawling? Is to crawl? So you could say hai hairu, right? No, what's to crawl? How do you say to crawl? How? So, so anyway, you can put the crawl verb in front. So to crawl, crawling, enter, um, and in the course of time, you can imagine how that might. To boil down into kind of like just a set of prefixes. It, it almost is that now, uh, pretty much like the uh, Nez Perce system. Um, and I guess finally, then, the uh, Atsugewi has yet another satellite system, and that's the cause system. You already saw the cause system uh, with some of the examples. Uh, and just to go over a few of them, they have uh, some two dozen of these cause prefixes, which mean things like as the result of an object's own weight acting on it, as the result of heat acting on it, as the result of the wind blowing on it, as a result of the rain falling on it. Um, and then there are uh, objects. So as a result of acting on it with a linear object moving axially, such as by uh, prodding, uh, poking, uh, propping. Uh, there's another which is that's uh, two. There's another which is which is as a result of um, an, a linear object moved moving uh, obliquely with re with respect to the ground object, such as by by scraping, by um, whittling, by uh, pulling a canoe, uh, and there's another which is by swinging. So that uh, that would be like by swatting, by chopping, and so forth. And, it goes, and there's a whole set that has to do with the, with the body parts. So that's how those, that, that system works. 
So uh, I think we're in a position then to look at these as kind of like a typology now can have the, the main typological system of what shows up in the verb, those three things, and the sub-categorization for each of those where the other things show up. So for the main, for, for the most prevalent type where what shows up in the verb is the path, um, uh, languages like Spanish basically have no other, have no satellite. A language like Nespers, which is, is like Spanish, but then it uses, it uses a satellite position to express the manner. And a uh, language like Caddo uses the satellite position to express the figure or the ground. Um, then if you go to the, um, uh, the English type where the verb root incorporates the, uh, the co-event, the manner or the cause, then uh, the satellite is typically used to represent the path. Uh, and if you go to the Atsugewi type, where the, uh, the verb is used to express the figure, the thing that's moving, then it has, in fact, two satellite systems, one to represent the uh, cause and the other to represent the uh, path plus ground together. So this is where all these these subcategorizations take place where all the different parts of a motion event wind up sh showing up on the surface uh, where, where they show up. So now we can discuss an issue of uh, salience. Uh, it, there seems to be a general principle uh, where if some concept shows up in the verb or satellite, it is relatively backgrounded there it is in attention. It, you can express it with relative backgrounding. Whereas if it's expressed in anything else, like a noun or a, a phrase or a clause, then, or a gerund of any sort, then it is uh, ipso facto foregrounded. It, it's more called into attention. So languages, so up to this point, we might have said, well, every language is simply uh, equivalent in that in every, in every case there's the universal phenomenon of uh, what the semantic uh, structure is of the, of the motion event with its components and their particular relations. And um, uh, every language simply has its own way or its own typological category for deploying those components where to put them. But there is a difference. Um, it turns out that whatever the language ha way the language has for where it puts its uh, component, whatever it puts in the verb or the satellite, that gets backgrounded. And you can't capture that in any other language, in a language that does it differently. So for example, if you contrast English with Spanish, uh, English can, uh, oh, I forgot to, to say that the English satellite system has the capacity to include many different aspects of the path within a single satellite phrase. I think there's a satellite phrase. So for example, um, you can have up to four satellites in English. So uh, let's say there's a child with a, in a, who's built a tree house up in a tree, and, uh, and the child's a parent of the child wants the child to come down. The parent can say to the child, come right back down up from up in there. Okay, so here's the English sentence. It's come right back down out. And you have this crescendo of stress. All those four are satellites, right back down out. And then you suddenly lower your voice to say from up in there. And so the from, and then the up in there is just like, acting like a noun. So come right back down out from up in there. So um, in this case, we've expressed three separate kinds of um, Right is, means um, immediately. I don't know if it's a satellite, but it's sort of acting like one. Uh, back is, means a return trip. Down means descent. Out means uh, exit. So try and do that in Spanish. You can't. Uh, if you um, want to say something like, uh, he ran back down into the, into the cellar, um, uh, uh, Spanish 
has to pick one of those three uh, path notions for its verb, and that's all it can do. Then it's done. Um, it, so you can say, um, instead of he ran back down to the cellar, you can say he uh, uh, returned to the cellar. Volvió, volvió al sótano corriendo. So he returned to the cellar running. So you can background the return trip, but then what are you going to do with the fact that it's down and uh, in? Um, uh, if you try to say it, it's probably very awkward, but if you try to say it, it would be highly um, foregrounded, uh, called attention to. Or you could have picked um, the man um, uh, uh, ran back down into the cellar. You could say, that el, el, el hombre bajó corriendo al sótano. Well, okay, uh, now you have the man uh, descended to the cellar running, corresponding to English down, but now what are you going to do about the back part and the in part? You, yes, you could add a phrase like de nuevo uh, or otra vez, something like meaning again, or, um, but then you've highly foregrounded the fact that it's a return, and so forth. So you get the idea that because of the setup of what is placed where, languages genuinely differ as to what and how much they can background, express in a backgrounded way without, without calling much attention to it. And Atsugewi outdoes English in this respect. So in, it, in, this, in this sampling is the master of being able to background information without calling attention to it. So for example, if you take the sentence, which I gave earlier, uh, <clears throat> Literally, um, you've got uh, stuck, meaning uh, it's uh, icky material moved, that's the stuck part. Uh, itsta is interliquid, tua, as, as a result of the wind blowing on it. For each of these, you could put a noun phrase out front, like you could say, bits hor, is the noun for guts. You could say, Bits uh, hor, what would you say? Che. Bits hor che. Uh, uh, so there you put the guts. Or you could put, say, jumewe, uh, in the into the creek. Jumewe, uh, into the creek. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, equally <laughs> blue. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but you don't need these nouns. Uh, that, if you included them, you would foreground them. The verb parts themselves uh, represent the same concept, but in a backgrounded way. Now, if English were to try and replicate, equal, the informational content, we would necessarily foreground some of these concepts. So, if you, if English try to equal the informational content in, in the generically, you'd have to say something like something icky uh, blew into something liquid. Well, now you've really foregrounded the icky and the liquid. Or if you wanted to instantiate it, you could say something like guts blew into the creek. But now you've foregrounded guts and creek by, by virtue of there being nouns. If, however, you wanted to equal the backgrounded flavor of the of the Atsugewi sentence, then you'd probably have to use the sentence like English, it blew in. But now you have to drop all the informational specificity that the it is uh, something icky and the in is something liquid. So there's this trade-off between uh, backgroundedness and inform infor in informativeness. Okay, I think um, I'm going to conclude with, uh, I've basically gone through the, the whole theoretical part. I'm returning now to the English type of um, co-event conflation uh, because uh, the co-event conflation is, in, in these languages, in an English type language, is, is enormously elaborated. Uh, and, um, and Ch maybe Chinese does it to some extent as well. Um, 
And the, I'm just picking the fourth thing out of a, a set of things that are kinds of elaborations that show up in English-type languages that, again, Spanish-type languages can't hope to do. And uh, now here's uh, uh, the particular thing at issue here is, what is the temporal and what is the, what is the relation between the verb and the satellite? Um, you may remember that the, the satellite is arising from that, the main verb event, like, you know, the, um, the, uh, what do I want, the rock rolled down the hill, so down the hill is from the main thing, then you might have, with the cause of, a gust of wind blew on it. So uh, the rock moved down the hill from a gust of wind, so the rock blew down the hill. Well, the verb comes from this, the verb in the normal sentence comes from this outlying co-event, whereas the, the, uh, the preposition thing comes from the main event. So it's kind of, it's almost as if it were reversed from what you might expect. Okay, so what, is, what are the relationships? Well, the, uh, if we go in temporal sequence, um, the first one is going to be precursion. This is where the co-event occurs way before, or, or before, the event of the verb. Uh, the co-event, which shows up in the verb, occurs before the main motion event, which shows up, which is reflected in the preposition. An example would be uh, glass splintered over the rug. So what ha this comes from the glass, glass moved over the rug with the precursion of the glass splintered. So first the glass splinters, then it moves down onto the rug. So uh, in fact, that's the reason it's moving down onto the rug probably is because it's splintered. So, um, uh, and so that, this is the first kind of relationship that can show up between them is precursion. That's a non-agent of example. An agent of example would be, let's say the scientist ground the seeds into the test tube. So here's, here's the test tube, grinding seeds. As you grind, they fall into the test tube. Well, the grinding precedes the falling into the test tube. Um, so this is scientist caused, or you know, caused to move, moved the seeds into the test tube, that's the main motion event, with the, with the precursion of, uh, he ground the seeds. So the grinding is, which shows up in the verb, is, pre, is occurs before the motion event. Next is enablement. In enablement, uh, the, the verbal part, the co-event, occurs immediately before the motion event and enables it. Uh, without it, the motion event could not have occurred. If I say to you, could you reach me that bottle down off the shelf? Or could you grab me that bottle down off the shelf? What that comes from is, could you move the bottle down off the shelf with the enablement of having first reached to it? So here's the bottle on the shelf. It means, I reach, could you please reach to the bottle, the shelf, and having grabbed it, move it down off the shelf. So, and whereas, what's the verb that shows up in the sentence? It's reach. Could you reach me that bottle down off the shelf? So it means, could you get me, could you move that bottle down off the shelf with the precursion of having, your, having first reached to it? With grab, it's the same. Could you grab me that bottle down off the shelf? Could you move it down off the shelf having first grabbed it? Okay, that's enablement. Next is, next temporal, and we're getting closer, is uh, cause. And there's like onset causation. So the tent moved down into the gully with the cause of, and this is onset causation instead of extended, a uh, gust of wind blew on it. So, so the tent moved down into the gully from a gust of wind. Um, or 
uh, we've had this type already, or agentive is uh, batted the puck across the ice, off across the ice. So it um, means um, I caused the, the, buck, the puck uh, moved across the ice with the onset cause of I batted it or batted the puck, then the puck moves. So I batted the puck off across the ice. Um, with continued extended causation, so now we're, it's actually concurrent, the two time things are concurrent, water boiled down to the midline of the pot. So here's the pot, starts off with the water at the top. Uh, the water moved down to the midline of the pot was the extended cause of the water was boiling. That's what caused it to move down to the midline of the pot. And again, you take boil and you get the water boiled down to the midline of the pot. With an agent, you could say I squeezed the toothpaste out of the tube, I guess. Um, or however, that's extended causation. Then we've got, got manner, which we've seen many examples of. Um, the top spun past the lamp means the top moved past the lamp with the manner of the top was spinning. Uh, and uh, whatever examples, these are again concurrent. Then another concurrent type is uh, what I call concomitant, which is where uh, the co-event uh, is not a manner that the figure itself, um, that, that's involved in the figure's motion. It's independent of the figure's motion. Nevertheless, it's something that the figure is, is it's an activity that the figure is manifesting concurrently with its motion. So one example is she wore a green dress to the party. This comes from she went to the party with the concomitance of she wore a green dress. They're unrelated events. Wearing a green dress doesn't uh, abet going to the party. But nevertheless, you can conflate them in English. She wore a green dress to the party. Um, similarly, uh, concomitance is not that well expressed in English. It's very easily easily expressed in Atsugewi. Um, so another example is uh, he whistled past the graveyard. It means he walked past the graveyard it, with the concomitance of he was whistling. It means as he walked past the graveyard, he whistled. He was whistling as he walked past it. Next is, uh, uh, what do I call it? Uh, concurrent result. Uh, must be a better name for that, but anyway. Um, it's uh, for sentences like, um, the door slammed uh, shut. Well, here's the, here's the doorway. Here's the door. The door slammed shut. Shut is the uh, path satellite. It tells you what happened. Well, what's slam? Well, slam is what happens at the very end point of the path event, of the path portion. Then it's slammed. So that's why I'm calling it a uh, concurrent result. It's, it's the result, but it's con otherwise concurrent with the, with the path. So the, the co-event, the part about slamming, is now at the very terminal edge of the prepositionally indicated path. Another example of it is the, the rocket splashed into the water. It means when it, as it entered the water, uh, the rocket moved into the water with the, the, um, the, the concomitant result, with the with concurrent result of that, the water splashed. So it's the exact entry point of it. Uh, finally, consequence, um, where the, uh, the, the co-event actually occurs, as represented by the verb, actually occurs after the prepositional event the motion event, the path. An example is uh, if I'm in an office building, I'm on the 10th floor, you're on the 5th floor, and I'm going to go down to lunch. I can call you on the phone and I'll say, I'll stop, I'll stop down at your office on my way out of the building. I say, well, stop down at your office. That means I'll go down uh, to your office, I'll go down to your office, and then stop at it. So the stopping, which is the, the, uh, the co-event, and shows up in the verb, stopping at, uh, shows up, it follows the event of going down. 
So it's all stop down at. So first you go down, then you stop. That's unlike anything we've had so far. Similarly, uh, I'll look in at the stew uh, on the stove to see if it's okay. So I'll look in at means I'll go in and then look. So the looking follows the going in. Similarly, they locked the prisoner into his cell. Here's the cell. Here's the guards. They take the prisoner, put him in a cell, and only after he's in the cell do they then lock the door. So they locked him in. They locked him into a cell. In fact, English distinguishes. They locked him into a cell, and they locked him in a cell. Um, into means first they put him in, then they lock. They locked him in a cell. doesn't matter. He could have already just been there. And with the door open, then they just lock him in a cell. So it's a, it's a distinction. The into one is one of these consequence ones. So I, I think I, I should stop there. Um, uh, just to summarize, the whole issue here has been um, there is a conceptual domain. In this case, I've worked on the domain of a motion event. Um, and if you look at the, if you take a, a conceptual domain, it, some of them are universal. All languages do them the same. That's the way I've been, all my preceding talks have, have been about. Today's talk has been about a, a conceptual domain, which languages systematically do in certain different ways. Uh, where they represent the uh, elements of, the, uh, of this conceptual domain in a systematic way. Furthermore, what, um, each language it can be amazingly consistent in its pattern for where, how it selects to place these elements of the universal domain in, uh, in surface sentences. It can be very thoroughgoing. Um, in covering a, a wide range of semantic types and, and metaphoric extensions of these types. Um, third, it's, I, I've tried to, like when I went into how Atsugewi rep expresses different kinds of into, uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the lessons from this kind of cross-comparison work is how utterly different languages can subdivide the world. It's the original kind of Worfian uh, observation. Um, how differently they can subdivide the world and uh, anything that you might have thought to yourself, this must be universal because my language does it and English does it and, and Turkish does it. Well, there may be some language in the world that does it quite differently. And that's why you really need to look at a lot of different languages, especially the more exotic ones, less familiar ones, um, to see how human cognition, what it's capable of. Okay, that's fine.